Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Center for International Governance Innovation. My name is Colleen Fitzpatrick, and I would like to say a very special welcome. Thank you very much for coming this evening. We're very excited um, to present our speaker on uh, climate change, Dr. Uh, Tatiana Saskina. I would like to uh, call to the podium the uh, CEO of WWF Canada, Mr. Uh, Gerald Butts, who will make her introduction. Thank you. Thank you very much, Colleen. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I think it's, uh, it, uh, it's, not, um, it's not too much of an exaggeration to say that this is one of the most important new institutions in this country. Um, and the, uh, uh, the thought leadership that CG is providing on a whole range of um, not immediately popular but very significant complex global issues is critical to public policy debate in this country and we're very proud to be associated with CG on this issue in particular. Uh, I want to say a couple of words about WWF before I have the, the distinct pleasure of uh, introducing our speaker uh, tonight. Uh, most of you probably know WWF as one of the world's largest and most respected NGOs. Um, in, uh, we're, operate, we're operating in 105 countries globally with about 5,000 people working for us um, and supporters of over 5 million around the globe. Most recently, we've become famous for Earth Hour, which I hope everyone will participate in uh, tomorrow night, uh, Saturday night. And if I seem a bit frazzled, frazzled it's because our, it's our busiest uh, week of the year from a public engagement perspective. I'm very proud to say that Canadians lead the world in per capita participation in Earth Hour. Last year, we had 10 million people participate, and to put that in some perspective for you, about 16 million watched the gold medal hockey game. Um, so we're pretty proud of our uh, ability to get 10 million people to. 10 million Canadians to do anything in concert is quite the achievement. So we invite you all to participate on Saturday night at 8.30. Um, we, are large, we have largely been known historically at WWF as a species-based conservation organization. Our focus on biodiversity conservation globally has made us famous, um, but the organization has evolved well beyond that to become one that focuses on what we believe are the most complex global environmental issues the biggest problems that take an organization of global reach and scale to work on and solve with partners like CG, um, large multinational partners in the uh, corporate sector and governments all over the world. At the top of that agenda um, globally is the problem of the Arctic, the challenge of the Arctic, the opportunity of the Arctic. This of course has special import for us here in this country and I'll go into that in a moment. But I think if I were to make a bold prediction, I would say that the Arctic over the next 10 to 15 years will become uh, one of the top uh, governance problems in human history. I think that uh, we've enjoyed a, uh, an extended period of peace in the Arctic, uh, largely because the resources have been unavailable for extraction and human consumption. That, of course, as we all know, due to climate change, and there's some irony in this for us at WWF, of course, is changing rapidly. Um, in this country, uh, where it's been our um, largely unobserved backyard for 147 years, uh, yet it comprises 40% uh, of our land mass and half of our coastline. This is a very complex, significant international problem. We are well aware, I think most of the people associated with CG and in this room would agree with this general uh, presupposition that this is a problem we cannot solve by ourselves, which is a... Uh, um, uh, which is a classic governance issue because after all what is governance other than the way we as a species come together to solve problems that we cannot solve uh, by ourselves. So we think there's a unique opportunity here in Canada uh, to bring the global perspective on the Arctic conversation, to bring the, Arctic, the global Arctic conversation to Canada and to bring the best of the Canadian perspective on the Arctic to the globe. So we're very happy to be working with CG on this critical file at this point in our country and indeed our world's history. And the speaker I have the pleasure of introducing uh, you to tonight has been at the forefront of this challenge um, for a very long time. Uh, she is uh, an internationally renowned expert on marine law. 
Um, and uh, I think she would rival this institution's uh, illustrious benefactor in her travel schedule over the last uh, couple of years because she's spoken at just about every meaningful um, Arctic conference in every circumarctic nation. One of the uh, great features of WWF is I believe we're the only international NGO that has a national presence in each circumarctic country. Uh, that's been a benefit for us as an organization globally and a bit of a drawback to Tatiana's time with her family because she spent a lot of her time in the last few years in each of those countries. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce Tatiana Saxena. I believe we'll have time for questions afterward, Colleen, and I look forward to dialoguing with many of you. Thank you very much for your attention. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for this opportunity to address you today on such an important and heatedly debated topic as the future of the Arctic and its governance in particular. But before I start, let's have a look at this magical place, the beautiful and enigmatic Arctic. Why have we chosen uh, to work in the Arctic in the first place? The Arctic is one of the world's largest, most valuable and pristine natural regions. This is a home to many charismatic species, including walrus, norwal, and polar bear. This is a key region for fossil fuels, minerals, and fisheries, and potentially for shipping. And the Arctic is a home to a diversity of human cultures. The Arctic is also key to the global climate system. Changes in the Arctic affect the rest of the world through global warming, rising sea levels, alteration of oceanic processes and circulation, potential release of huge volumes of methane. The Arctic has a unique population which has unique lifestyle in harmony with nature. This is why we strive to conserve the environmental conditions that sustain traditional lifestyle for present and future generations. However, there are serious problems and challenges facing the Arctic that accompany the emergence of a new ocean. A surge in, in large-scale economic activities is that needed to be environmentally friendly. New threats, pollution, oil spills, overfishing, and IUU fishing. Existing governance regime does not address these developments. This is why we need to change the way we are managing the Arctic collectively. A new regime is needed to regulate economic activities and protect the marine environment. To ensure a better future for the Arctic, WWF developed an Arctic initiative. And today, WWF is the leading environmental NGO focusing on pan-Arctic problems and solutions based on, sci on science. We have been working for over two decades on the protection of Arctic ecosystems. We have a relationship with all Arctic stakeholders. WWF also have has an observer status at the Arctic Council and its working groups. We are present in virtually every Arctic country. WWF has offices and dedicated teams in Canada, Russia, the US, Norway, Denmark, Sweden, and Finland. WWF has been actively exploring Arctic governance issues for a considerable period of time. WWF's goal is to work with Arctic states and Arctic indigenous peoples to promote the closure of the Arctic governance gaps, protect Arctic environment, ensure sustainable ecosystem-based management of Arctic marine resources. We build our work around our vision of the Arctic. And a key principle for the Arctic, in our view, is good stewardship, which means conservation of the Arctic for future generations. 
cooperative planning and management of marine resources with a view of long-term sustainability. It also means responsibility for environmental quality shared by all those whose actions affect the environment. And now let me return back to the Arctic governance, which is the key tool to achieving our objectives. As the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea states, we need to have good governance and regulations in place in order to achieve the peaceful use of ocean, the equitable and efficient utilization of ocean resources, the conservation of living resources, the study, protection, and preservation of the marine environment. Ladies and gentlemen, the ice-covered Arctic Ocean did not require much regulation up until now. But as the ice retreats and climate changes, we need a common vision and international regulations for environmental protection in the face of rapidly increasing human activity. In order to have a clear picture of the current Arctic regulatory and governance regime, WWF commissioned three reports to examine the regime, identify governance and regulatory gaps, and analyze options for improvements. The reports overview and gap analysis, options for addressing identified gaps, and a proposal for a legally binding instrument are authored by well-known international legal exper experts, Timo Kaivurova and Eric Yap Molinar. These reports are a truly revolutionary study. They represent a comprehensive, in-depth analysis, the first such, such study in the field. Let me tell you briefly about the gaps of the regulatory and governance regime, which are indeed dangerous and profound. First of all, let's look at the Arctic Council and its constitutive document, the Ottawa Declaration. The Ottawa Declaration contains no legally binding obligations. The Council itself is not an operational body, it's a forum. It has limited participation. There is no continuous or guaranteed funding, and there is no permanent secretariat. There are also substantial law of the sea gaps. The United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea has an important role, but it is imperfect. It is a framework convention that does not provide all the necessary institutions and specific regulatory standards. UNCLOS contains only minimal rules for the protection of marine environment. Is this a flaw of UNCLOS? No, there is an intention. Regional rules must be created by states sharing the same marine environment. It requires regional implementation in several provisions, including Article 197, which we will see later. And to deal effectively with transboundary issues, regional implementation is often indispensable. Uh, in short, we probably need to revisit existing rules of international law, particularly the law of the sea, as it was put by Javier Salana and Benita ferrero Waldner. Now let's look at the sectoral governance and regulatory gaps. Fisheries in the Arctic are not covered well enough by international law. The Arctic contains many of the world's richest remaining fishing grounds, but climate change is affecting these fisheries already. As water temperatures change, fish stocks are moving around, and as the Arctic ice continues to decline, untested fishing grounds open up. This leaves loopholes that could be exploited. Previous experience elsewhere in the world shows that underregulated fisheries can quickly lead to the collapse of fish stocks and undermine whole ecosystems. In the shipping area, 
Existing agreements on contingency planning and preparedness aim to respond to marine pollution accidents do not cover the entire Arctic. This is why in a case of an oil spill, like the infamous Exxon Valdez accident, Arctic states might be totally unprepared to take timely and effective measures to respond to an accident. A related gap is the absence of a regional agreement on search and rescue. What happens if a modern cruise ship carrying 3,000 passengers on board runs aground on the, in the Arctic? The Explorer accident, which took place in the Antarctic, is a good reminder of the dangers of the polar tourism. The vessel hit an iceberg and ran aground. And as a result, the passengers spent several hours in lifeboats in sub-zero temperatures. This is an example of a miraculous rescue. But, however, there, are, uh, there might be a major loss of life at sea if there are no search and rescue arrangements in place before the accident. There is no regional approach by Arctic states to ensure compliance with applicable international rules and standards, as well as national laws and regulations. It's even uncertain to what extent the IMO Arctic shipping guidelines are complied with by states, ship owners, operators, and crew. In the area of oil and gas activity, the only international regulation in the Arctic is a series of guidelines issued by the Arctic Council. These guide guidelines are not legally enforceable, and there is no systematic check of whether they are followed. This is a major gap considering the potential impact of oil and gas activities in the Arctic. Um, and in a case, um, in a case of oil spills, we do know that industry officials admit themselves that there is no effective methods of cleaning up these oil spills on ice-covered waters, and these spills are bound to happen. When they do, the impact is devastating. A small spill in the Varangenfjord in the northern Norway killed as many as 20,000 guillemots, beautiful seabirds. The Exxon Valdez spill in Alaska killed about a quarter of a million seabirds. Conclusion? In many areas, either there are no legal protections or they are too weak to be effective. Finally, let's look at the gaps in cross-sectoral governance and regulation. There is no specific legally binding obligation, procedure, or body for pursuing ecosystem-based management. No procedure for transboundary environmental impact assessments or strategic environmental assessments. Finally, there is no representative network of marine protected areas. What is the right approach to the new governance then? How can we provide for a good governance regime? We would need to fill the governance gaps, ensure protection of the Arctic marine environment, establish integrated cross-sectoral ecosystem-based management, build on existing frameworks. We have to balance the rights, interests, and obligations of states indigenous peoples in the international community. We have to address transboundary issues and effects. We have to take proactive and precautionary approach. In doing so, do we choose hard or soft law? Soft law means not legally binding rules. It is good where no substantial investments need to be made. But it's not used in areas which require effective governance, since it does not provide reciprocal guarantees of performance with the possibility for reacting to breaches or non-compliance. On the other hand, hard law offers some advantage. 
potential for increasing state's obligations through the elaboration on, of enforceable targets, timetables, and scheduled dues. It attracts more serious attention from states. It does not necessarily mean years and years of negotiations. As you can see, the Carpathian Convention was negotiated and adopted in two years. In our view, the best way to remedy the regulatory and governance regime is through regional cooperation, undertaken in a framework such as UNCLOS. Because regional cooperation is the best solution to problems specific for a group of countries sharing the same marine environment. This is why we have the regional seas agreements. Over 140 countries participate in 13 regional seas programs. Most of shared marine waters are protected by the regional seas agreements. So why the Arctic Ocean? is an exception then. Moreover, this is explicitly required by the Law of the Sea Convention. Article 197 urges states to cooperate on a global basis or on a regional basis in formulating and elaborating international rules, standards, and recommended practices and procedures for the protection and preservation of the marine environment taking into account characteristic regional features. What if we have an Arctic Regional Seas Agreement in place? This is what the report, a proposal for a legally binding agreement, suggests. The Arctic needs tailor-made rules for Arctic conditions, since, as I already mentioned, UNCLOS only provides an overarching framework which is not Arctic specific. The goal is not to dismiss UNCLOS rules, but to make them work in the Arctic at the regional level through regional specific rules of protection, like for example, the Caspian Sea's Regional Seas Agreement. The Arctic marine environment will indeed be better protected if it has its own Regional Seas Agreement. The proposal for a legally binding instrument offers an international agreement compatible with and complementary to UNCLOS, which would consist of regional framework convention with annexes on specific issues, like, for example, monitoring and assessment, and protocols on sectoral governance and regulation. The objective would be protection and conservation of the Arctic marine environment, long-term conservation and sustainable and equitable use of the Arctic marine resources, maintaining peace, order, and stability in the Arctic, ensuring socio-economic benefits for present and future generations with specific reference to indigenous Arctic peoples. It would be based on the general principles of precautionary approach, ecosystem approach, and use of traditional knowledge. What do we do, however, in a case negotiations for such an agreement take longer than expected and human activities commence earlier or expand at a faster pace than expected, or if the Arctic states decide not to pursue the path of a legally binding agreement at all? We would need a safety net that would lay down at least a minimum level of protection. A carefully designed network governance system might become a safety net or even a new Arctic governance system itself. Such a system of network governance would have equal participation by all interested parties, clear articulation of policy objectives, explicit system of monitoring and reporting on actions to meet objectives. It will provide equal access to data as well as capacity to analyze the data. It will be based on modern systems of communications, 
analysis and decision making through the internet as well as on actual participation by interested parties in the design and implementation of governance and management strategies. As you can see, there are several choices which may be pursued simultaneously. The avenue of multilateral governance requires a certain degree of flexibility in order to deal effectively with individual and collective interests of Arctic states when it comes to advocating for the governance improvements. So what can we do next? Um, we can facilitate a circumpolar dialogue on multilateral governance resulting in best governance solutions. We can provide Arctic states with in-depth analysis of the problems, collectively offer our experience and advice on solutions to the Arctic states. WWF and CG are in a unique position to influence Arctic states to turn their attention to the multilateral governance by convening indigenous peoples' dialogue on multilateral governance by reaching out to Arctic governments, by providing good stewardship principles, and by advising on the best governance options. We have seen several Arctic governance initiatives failing recently. They have not offered a comprehensive analysis of governance problems. They did not reach out to states and didn't offer convincing options. This is a right time for us to join our efforts and offer effective solutions. And based in Canada, CG is in a unique position to influence the debate on multilateral governance and convince Arctic states to make a right choice. So why should we bother? Uh, because we have only one chance, and wise use is a must. This is a pristine environment and a unique ecosystem. This is a global public good. And we do have an obligation of environmental stewardship in the Arctic. Only through careful stewardship by Arctic countries and Arctic peoples can environmental damage and degradation be prevented. We do offer a unique and effective partnership. And together we can make a difference. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Siskina. We'd like to open up the floor for questions now from our audience. Um, we do have a microphone here on your right-hand side. If you'd like to step up to the microphone uh, with your uh, question um, for either Mr. Betts or Dr. Siskina, please just introduce yourself, maybe your affiliation within the community, and, um, and one or two short questions. Thank you. Everybody's convinced. I am Matt, uh, no affiliation. Uh, I was wondering, uh, of the countries you named that have a stake in the game, where are we at as far as pulling together an agreement? Like who's, trying, who's the front runner, who's holding it up? Do we see something coming into place in the future? Like tangibly, where is it at? Thank you. Um. This is a very interesting question. Thank you for asking this. Um, we're now um, in a very interesting position because there are suggestions for a new legally binding agreement. There are a lot of um, environmental organizations, NGOs, um, and public figures who suggest that we should have such an agreement in place. 
And we believe that states now turn their attention to multilateral governance, and they might consider a new agreement quite seriously. This is true that we do not hear any proposals from the Arctic states, but we should note that Arctic states only recently turned their attention to the issue of multilateral governance. This is why we have to allow some room for consideration and wait and see. I, I can be a little uh, um, more specific in the Canadian context. I think the, uh, if we were ranking countries, I think Norway probably has the most uh, uh, thoughtful approach to this and the, most long, the longest standing interest. Um, in Canada, it's almost as if you know we've been living in an uh, we've been living on farmland for 149 years, and Mississauga has suddenly grown up around us. Now we've got to take our neighbors a little more seriously than we have in the past in this region, and uh, none of that is to fault successive Canadian governments for a lack of attention to this file. In fact, if we ever comment on the current government's approach to it, it's to compliment them for at least paying this much, this much attention to it. So um, to underscore the point that Tatiana was making, I think it's an evolutionary process um, and uh, it's not too surprising that there aren't fully evolved positions on multilateral governance because you have some states with long-standing relationships who are feeling each other out uh, through a variety of different fora. But Norway, if we had to go the top five list, I'd pick Norway as number one. <laughs> Oh, sorry. Sorry. I thought there was only one microphone. Um, you mentioned in your presentation a special reference to Indigenous peoples, and I wanted uh, if you could expand on what that would specifically look like in a global framework in terms of their rights and responsibilities. And uh, the second part to my question on that would also be given uh, Canada's reluctance to uh, ratify the uh, international agreement on the rights of indigenous peoples. Uh, how likely do you think Canada's government would be towards uh, an international Arctic agreement which would include a uh, particular um, reference to indigenous peoples? Do you want to start with a global perspective on indigenous peoples? So yes. I can handle it. Uh, thank you very much for this question. I really think that um, this is very important to mention indigenous peoples because um, in our idea of an ideal governance regime, we would like to follow the steps of the Arctic Council. And we do believe that um, the role which indigenous peoples are given in the Arctic Council can be um, can be used in any governance system. For example, in a case of a new legal agreement, indigenous peoples can be granted the same role as in, in the Arctic Council. Uh, but uh, speaking about Canada, uh, this is a very important. I know that the role of indigenous peoples is very important in this country, and this is really amazing. I wish um, my own country, Russia, would have the same relationship with indigenous peoples. But I think um, new um, governance arrangement would be very beneficial for indigenous peoples. We have to think not just about the protection of marine environment, but also about the development. And if we do it sustainably, we preserve this unique nature while using these resources in a wise manner. I think this is the greatest gift we can give to indigenous peoples. Would you like to I, add I something? I can just expand on the Canadian context a little bit. I understand where you're coming from, believe me. I think that uh, um, Canada's relationship with Indigenous peoples is favorable by comparison to many countries, but in absolute terms we've got a lot of work to do, of course. Um, the benefit of uh, um, 
you know, most people don't understand the, the legal and regulatory power that um, uh, treaty organizations, uh, indigenous treaty organizations have in northern Canada. Um, the Inuvialuit in particular in the Western Arctic have more authority than any province in the country for land-based uh, development. Uh, it's, there's no question that Nelly Cornway is a more important figure when it comes to, for instance, the Mackenzie Valley Pipeline than it is the Premier of the Northwest Territories. I think that's just a, a hard-won um, uh, subrogated right under our Constitution that's been litigated and settled. So I, that's kind of the legal point of view. But the, the, the moral point of view, I think, is uh, uh, more compelling on this front, and that is this is our history that's playing out, and this is the Western world's history that's playing out in the Arctic. The Industrial Revolution started about 300 years ago, and um, the next 50 years of change uh, environmentally, which will be felt most acutely in the Arctic, is really just a pl playing out of that drama. Um, this is our past coming, coming to visit us. So the irony, of course, is that many of the communities uh, who've least participated in the material prosperity created by that period are the first to feel the impact of the climate problem in northern Canada. And this is a real ethical and moral problem that we've got to square as a country. I think helpfully, there's um, this is a kind of a working theory we have at WWF Canada, that the more legal authority given to Aboriginal peoples on resource issues, the better and more sustainable resource extraction is going to be at the end of the day. So one of the main um, uh, things that we're working on here, largely what we do in our own domestic Arctic program is indi in indigenous uh, outreach and relationship building um, across the Canadian Arctic. And we really believe that there's an opportunity to, to create a model for sustainable resource extraction in the Arctic working in concert with indigenous peoples because unlike many, you know, I grew up in a coal mining town in eastern Nova Scotia, Glace Bay is not a great place to try and uh, buy oceanfront, sell oceanfront property these days. Um, it, the, the local benefit of resource extraction has been minuscule in the history of this country. We think there's an opportunity to change that in the Arctic by working with indigenous people. So we see it as a critical relationship. Um, I have three questions, two of which I hope are brief. Um, one is the, there was a mention of an agreement, the Car, hmm, Carpathian uh, agreement. I don't know what that is, so um, if you could explain why that's, what that is and, uh, and what's that's relevant. Also, you mentioned um, several attempts at uh, Arctic governments that have fallen apart, and I'm wondering if you could give some context on those. And then thirdly, having to do, again, with Indigenous people, and in particular the WWF. I know that, I don't know whether it's a majority view, but I know that there is uh, anger and sort of mistrust for environmentalist, uh, for environmentalist groups as a whole um, amongst some in indigenous communities, especially over things like um, the ban on uh, seal, seal furs and seal skins. And I'm wondering how that's playing out and sort of what the WWF and other NGO, environmentalist NGOs are doing to sort of rebuild that trust or, or develop a sort of trust um, because relations are so strained. Maybe I'll deal with the last one and then you can deal with the fact-based questions that uh, you have to have actual uh, analytical knowledge to answer, so I'll try, I'll try with the first one. Um, there's no doubt what you say about the relationship between southern groups of all kinds, uh, ENGOs most pointedly for uh, a variety of good reasons, frankly. Um, uh, with local communities everywhere, I think you can, you can broaden that. Um, at WWF, uh, I, I like to think, and I, I think we have a lot of evidence for this, largely because of our grounding in science and the generally positive approach we take to problem solving. We're not the, you know, the common uh, placard waving type of NGO. We're more a science-based solutions oriented organization. I think we have a hard fought um, and hard won reputa positive reputation overwhelmingly in the Canadian Arctic. Um, now, of course, it's, uh, 
it's easy to get tarred uh, with the same brush as other groups. I think, for instance, you mentioned the seal hunt. Uh, I always say that the seal, the six weeks of the seal hunt uh, during the Canadian seal hunt, the Atlantic seal hunt, is the worst six weeks of my year because we're actually not opposed to the seal hunt. Um, there's no uh, conservation-based reason to be against it. It's really an animal rights and uh, humane, uh, humane treatment issue, which we don't, that's not our cup of tea. We're a science-based conservation organization. Yet, obviously, the activities of other groups on issues like that influence our reputation. So we have to be, um, we have to be uh, pretty vigilant in defending that. The truth is the only way to build uh, trusting relationships, be it between groups of people or individuals, is to be present over time. And uh, we've been in the, the Canadian Arctic at WWF Canada for almost 40 years. Uh, and uh, we've worked in concert to develop basic conservation science with Indigenous peoples all over the Arctic. So we're pretty confident that we have um, a deep relationship with Indigenous peoples that will withstand kind of turbulent uh, moments. Uh, but we, we are uh, constructive but often critical friends with all of the groups whom we operate with because we have, <coughs> we have an independently derived perspective on science-based issues. So we, we like to believe that um, even on issues where we disagree, we can do so constructively over time. I just want to add something to this. Um, WWF actually is one of the first um, NGOs to issue a special policy how to work with indigenous peoples. So we uh, probably we was the first organization to do it. And we really do it carefully. We always consider indigenous peoples as our partners. We are not just a conservation organization. We do work with communities. And across the world, WWF has very good relationship with indigenous people. We not only help to protect the environment, we also help communities to develop themselves and help them to have to have healthy life conditions, which comes with clean nature. Now I want to return to the, uh, to the Carpathian Convention. This is a very interesting convention for the protection of the environment of the Carpathian area, the mountains. And it's quite interesting uh, from the standpoint that the negotiations for this convention started in 2001 by the government of Ukraine. And the convention was adopted in 2003. So this is a very short period of time. And it's a hugely successful convention. I wonder if you address any of the more traditional security issues in the, in the Arctic, and I'm thinking, uh, you know, the Soviets and the Americans have both do uh, submarine patrols and that, that sort of thing. Have, does, that, does that enter into your uh, uh, mandate at all? Um, I think the security issues in the Arctic always attract a lot of attention uh, because um, they are in the news. Um, they always sound very threatening. But I think we pay too much attention to these issues uh, because uh, Arctic is the area well regulated by international law. And we should not expect any armed conflicts there. And uh, we sometimes do witness some um, military exercises or very bold statements from some governments. But we should consider them as a part of a bigger game for political influence. If I could just add to that in the Canadian context, I think um, uh, security is always a, a, a concern at any border, regardless of uh, whether it borders on a frozen ocean or the 49th parallel. 
um, and any responsible national government is going to take that responsibility very seriously. Uh, the perspective that we've taken on the Canadian position, which is fairly commonly, uh, it's fairly fairly common analysis in the circumarctic circum region, is that we've we sort of had two legs of a three-legged stool. Um, we focused on sovereignty and security, but very little on stewardship. Um, and our view is a little more expansive than uh, the first two, that uh, true security is found in uh, commonly shared institutions and values throughout a region. I mean, Europe became one of the more, most secure continents. Um, I'm not saying we need the European Union in the Arctic. Don't, it's an analogy, not an imperfect one, admittedly. But building common public institutions of governance uh, is the best way to ensure mutual security in the Arctic. Um, and mutual security not only amongst the directly uh, uh, related states, but of course, you know, there, there's very significant interest in Arctic resources outside the traditional Arctic nations. Um, I, I read a, a report last week that suggested that China will be spending more money on Arctic research than any country in the world next year. These are significant issues, and I, I don't say that to be, you know, alarmist about it. I think uh, uh, having a sixth of the, uh, a fifth of the world's population entitles you to an un basic understanding of where the resources of the world are likely to come from. But um, security is just more than than uh, guns and steel. I think. I wanted to ask, I was curious about two, uh, one was you hear about the polar bears, uh, if there was a quick update, and secondly was about the storage of the um, obsolete nuclear submarines in the uh, Russian Arctic. I'm going to deal with the submarines, I'll deal with the polar bears. <laughs> no, let's do it. Okay, <laughs> Well, I, I believe that uh, the issue of polar bears is the, um, one of the most successful in the Arctic because we do have a regulatory regime and uh, states do pay attention to this issue because this is a, a very charismatic species. Um, so I think the polar bears are in the best position <laughs> probably even better than people. Uh, but coming to the nuclear submarines, uh, this is indeed a very big issue, and uh, I know that um, this uh, issue is often raised uh, by Russia's neighbors, for example, by Norway. And I do know that Russia has plans how to deal with this. Unfortunately, there are no real actions we haven't seen any uh, actions so far, but hopefully they will come very soon. Just to quickly elaborate on the, the polar bear aspect of your question, I think you're probably referring to the recent um, uh, debate about uplisting polar bears as, uh, um, uh, in, under the Convention of, on International Trade and Endangered Species, the sort of recent debate on polar bears. This, is kind of, this kind of ties to the gentleman's question on indigenous peoples. There were, there, were, there were a lot of groups around the world that took politically motivated positions uh, that, had, that were unsupported by science to basically ban subsistence hunting and all trade in polar bear parts. And um, the perspective we took, which was sort of uncomfortable politically for us, but was grounded in science, is that uh, the, the minimal trade that exists in polar bear parts and the subsistence hunt in Aboriginal community, in Indigenous communities in Northern Canada, largely, um, we have 40% of the world's polar bears in Canada. Um, has nothing to do with the overall health of the population. Uh, the truth is, the real threat to polar bears in the North um, is climate change, and uh, there are many. You know, I've heard many great statistics on this, but one of my favorite ones is a. Um, one of Canada's leading sea ice experts, the University of Winnipeg, once said that uh, uh, the last time the Arctic uh, was open and had no ice was a million years ago, and polar bears are roughly a million years old, and these two things are not accidental, right? Um, that's not a coincidence. So for us, the real issue is climate change mitigation, uh, first and foremost, but developing a resilience-based adaptation strategy for polar bears where we create an international refugia for the animal at the top of the planet. 
you know, uh, to give you one, one quick anecdote about it, we, we were just in Churchill in November. Um, uh, Churchill's kind of the, one of the most southerly outposts in Canada for polar bears, but it's very popular. It's sort of where polar bears wait for the bus every November, right? The ice comes in and they go out. Uh, and of course, it's very, very present in the Canadian imagination. Um, for the first time ever, uh, killer whales are showing up in the west, western Hudson's Bay because there's, no, there's not significant ice cover to keep them out. Now, polar bears are known as uh, top of the food chain animals for a very good reason, but not when there are killer whales around. So when you hear uh, people talk about the unpredictable and dynamic aspects of climate change, think about that. Polar bears have not adapted to cohabitate, to cohabit with uh, killer whales in a marine environment. Uh, the whales will eat the uh, seals that bears prey on, and indeed they'll eat bears. So that's, these are very dynamic threats um, caused by climate change, not by um, a, a small hunt in indigenous communities. So our perspective is to keep our eye on the big picture. Uh, I would suggest that um, in the face of, I mean, to set aside conventional concerns of security, I think one of the most daunting invasions in the north is by big business. It seems so easy to get lost in the language of policy when in actual fact what is, what is not trans, um, transferred to me is the idea of individual agendas and although I'm reassured that the Carpathian Agreement was, was um, put into force in two years, I'm reassured, but is that a model for us? Does that actually give us any kind of outline or what, what sorts of issues does that specify or control. It, could you expand on that if it is applicable? Um, can you elaborate a little bit? <laughs> because I'm not sure I understood the question. Is the Carpathian Agreement a model for anything we're resolving in the Arctic? Uh, well, this is the Carpathian Convention is an example of a very short negotiation process. So when we do with a very urgent issue, and I believe that um, the protection of the Arctic marine environment is an urgent issue. We really should aim for a short period of negotiations. And this is why I brought this issue of the Carpathian Convention, because sometimes um, there are reservations. Uh, people say some international agreements have been negotiating for decades and decades. So this is not exactly the case. We have very good exceptions when states decide to come together and uh, resolve an important issue, this can be done very quickly. And just to add on, the, I think the commercial interest point was kind of at the heart of your question, and that is, forget about invasive species and climate change for a second, let's talk about uh, the commercial actors that will be moving into that environment. Um, this is one of the main reasons for the perspective we take on multilateral governance that as long as there's a wide disagreement amongst the parties, there's always going to be an opportunity for jurisdiction shopping for commercial interests. Um, we think that a key aspect of, uh, indeed a key aspect of our program, is to work with, uh, you know, it's, it, it, you don't need a, a, um, a PhD in business administration to figure out who the key actors are likely to be in the Arctic, so we like to in, um, engage directly with those actors um, to help them understand that it's in everybody's common interest to have a sustainable extraction of those resources and uh, a framework that allows for that extraction but um, also puts conservation first um, and that, that certainty is in everybody's best interest. There are always going to be outliers um, but a little known fact about the Arctic is that four of the ten largest fisheries in the world are in the Arctic today not 20 years from now, not 40 years from now, but today. Um, and the largest certified fishery in the world is in the Arctic, uh, the Alaskan Pollock. So there are, there's a lot of hope here, I think, is the point I'm trying to make, um, that uh, people, we can develop a set of shared values that will govern our activities, whether they be security-based, commercial, um, or uh, environmental in the Arctic. Yes, I, I'm wondering about the elephant in the room. Uh, 
the U.S., as I understand it, has not signed off uh, on the law of the sea, and neither the present present regime nor the last uh, seemed willing to concede anything as far as the Northwest Passage. I think history tells us that the U.S. is going to do whatever they want. <laughs> and I wonder how much influence we can be expected to have outside of the actual land masses. Uh, uh, well, this is true that <laughs> the U.S. is not a party to the Law of the Sea Convention. But I believe that um, this issue is seriously considered. And um, we have our colleague from uh, WWFUS who can answer this question. Just to note that uh, the elephant in the room in any Canadian conversation is always the, the United States. So uh, one, of the, one of the benefits of having uh, a global organization is a colleague from WWFUS, Bill uh, Eichbaum is here. Thanks. I flew up uh, this morning just for that question. I, I'm glad you asked it. Um, I th I, first of all, the U.S. Uh, is not, as you point out, uh, a signatory to the law of the sea, but the U.S. government does say uh, that it follows all of the provisions of the law of the sea as a matter of customary applicable international law. What that means is that we generally comply with the law of the sea, but in fact, some of the things that the law of the sea provides for, which is, for example, the regulation of claims uh, beyond uh, the outer continental shelf, we can't participate in. Uh, Canada, Russia, the other countries can. So we're actually at a substantial disadvantage, and that's a major reason why we're arguing before our Senate that they should provide um, for accession by the U.S., but you all maybe observed what happened last weekend on health care and you know that was a squeaker and uh, uh, I don't know whether we'll get Law of the Sea this year, maybe next year. Um, having said that, I, I think that the United States can be uh, along with Canada and Russia and as Gerald said earlier uh, with, with progressive thinking from Norway, a participant in a process as outlined by Tatiana that would provide for regional cooperative management uh, in, the, in the Arctic marine environment uh, pursuant to the kinds of ideas that have been discussed without being a party to the law of the sea. And quite frankly, it's in our interest to do that because we're not the biggest player up there. Canada and Russia are the big players from a territorial viewpoint, from a resource viewpoint, from a uh, viewpoint of the people, numbers of people living in the region. So it's really in our interest to join in a cooperative effort if we can begin to get that momentum going. And uh, we, we continue to press that case before our government. In uh, classic Canadian terms, you're usually more uh we're usually more amenable to uh, American cooperation when there's a Democrat in the White House, so we've got at least another three years to get this done. <laughs> I, I've noticed that there's very few marine protected areas in the, uh, in the world, and that there's probably a very unique opportunity to develop marine protected areas in the Arctic before traffic develops. I know Canada's developed a lot of uh, parks land-based parks in the last 20 years, but I'm just wondering, is there uh, much pressure or activity in developing large, uh, very large mar marine uh, protected areas in the Arctic? There are indeed very interesting proposals to develop uh, marine protected areas in the Arctic. Uh, some proposals refer to the high seas, which is kind of a difficult thing to achieve, but um, some of them actually um, very reasonable uh, proposals for uh, national waters or waters under national jurisdiction. Uh, and I know that um, many Arctic states have plans to establish more marine protected areas, 
for example, Norway has these plans. And um, actually, some um, international agreements um, in the Arctic provide for uh, marine uh, protected areas. For example, OSPAR tries to establish um, such an um, uh, area even in the high seas. So we will see the result so far. It didn't happen, but hopefully we will see it soon. I just add in, uh, this is a consequential issue all over Canada, not just in the Arctic. We have the, lo we have the longest coastline in the world, but for some reason, um, maybe it's because we don't have a New York or a Los Angeles on our coast, our major concentrations of people tend to be inland around the Great Lakes Basin. Um, we just don't have the same sort of public, uh, consistent public pressure on the government to establish marine protected areas. Uh, we think there's an opportunity to, to, to change that. Um, especially as the population grows on the West Coast, um, and uh, uh, we have real prospects of fisheries recovery on the uh, on the East Coast, and uh, uh, of course in this context the Arctic. Um, I think that it's uh, uh, politically speaking, it's it's um, it's almost a no-brainer for the government. They just wonder whether they get sufficient credit for doing it. Thank you very much for your, uh, oh, one more. Sorry. Okay. Uh, just a very simple question. Thank you for the brilliant presentation by a lovely lady. Um, one, one question is, in all these plans in the future, do we not think that the first top priority should be the welfare of the indigenous people? Uh, some of my best friends are Inuit. Uh, we agree with that wholeheartedly. I think that um, uh, the a lot of people t will draw an analogy between the Antarctic and the Arctic. And the, the first thing we say when people say that is the difference between the Antarctic and the Arctic is that there are millions of people in the Arctic, right? And have been for thousands of years. Uh, we are, they are living the consequences of our history, as I said earlier. Uh, and we have um, every reason to believe uh, that the ecosystem health of the Arctic is intrinsically tried, tied to the health of those communities. Not, that's not to say that there isn't a moral imperative um, uh, to foster the health of those communities, notwithstanding what happens in, in the natural world, but uh, as many uh, indigenous cultures know, as I'm sure you know, uh, they have a, um, a sense of that interplay between the natural and human world that many of us in our culture have lost. Hi, quick question. Um, I hate to reference Avatar, but if anyone's seen the movie, you know how under home tree is like where all the main resources are? Um, I genuinely believe that our home tree is slowly melting. And um, I know you're talking about creating a multilateral you know, policy agreement between all the Arctic states, but do you believe that the potential for conflict is very real and very great, considering um, the capital that could be made? Sorry, uh, interstate conflict or conflict between global actors and local communities? Um, no, I mean like between um, the, because you, you mentioned that you're trying to, there's trying to. I'm just to trying to draw the avatar analogy. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I mean, um, the potential for capital that can be made, like you said, in regards to the fisheries and everything else is, um, and I heard, you know, re rumors about there being oil and all, uh, wanting to drill for oil and, and things like that. And I'm just wondering um, how you feel about, um, if you could rate, like, how do I say this? Do you believe that there's a potential for con conflict between Norway, between Canada, between Russia over this, like, slowly melting sea? Sorry, is that okay? Yeah, sure. No, that's clear. Very clear. I don't think there is much room for the conflict in the Arctic. And as I mentioned already, uh, most of uh, the issues are regulated. This is a good question to what extent. <laughs> but when it comes to security, we shouldn't expect any major conflict. Because if we um, consider this issue of uh, grab of land, you know, which often raised uh, by media, there is no grab of land. 
everything is pretty well regulated. And the claims for the continental shelf can be resolved very easily according to international law. So I would not really expect any conflicts. Probably the biggest conflicts would be in the International Court of Justice, but no armed conflicts, I believe. Okay. And, and I'll just add to that. I think that the, the most tangible conflict you're going to see is uh, um, con serious conflicts between the interests of local people and global actors, uh, or national actors for that matter. I think that uh, um, there's a real opportunity here um, you know, one of the things I was going to say in my opening is that we, we fancy ourselves uh, great stewards of the natural environment in Canada. But if you look at our history when it comes to resource extraction, it's not that pretty, right? Um, we presided over the probably the greatest ecosystem collapse in the history of humanity in the Northwest Atlantic on the Grand Banks with the cod fishery. Um, uh, our history on forestry has turned around recently, but it wasn't pretty for a long time before then. And uh, whatever your perspective on the oil sands in Alberta, it's relatively unregulated. And uh, um, I don't think there's anybody who would argue it's been um, a sustainably exact extracted resource. What we're saying is that we've got an opportunity for once in this country to, to contribute to the global commons in the Arctic. And we've got probably 10 or 15 years before resource extraction begins in earnest to think this through and do it properly. Um, and uh, if, if, we, if we build the kind of conversation we think we can build in this country about it, I think it'll happen. Thank you very much. And thank you, Tatiana, for coming all this way. Thank you first to our audience for your interesting questions. And now it's my distinct uh, honor to be able to thank our speaker uh, this evening. So on behalf of the Center for International Governance Innovation to Dr. Saskina, thank you very much for your insightful presentation uh, with WWF's goal to promote the closure of the Arctic governance gaps that you mentioned and protection and preservation of the Arctic Ocean, of course its beauty. Thank you for giving us a deeper insight into your work and research and for uh, coming here from uh, Europe today to be with us. Um, if you have further questions, we also have um, some other representatives here from WWF. We've already heard, of course, from Gerald Butts, the CEO. And uh, thank you very much to uh, Bill Eichbaum, who is the Vice President um, of the Marine and Arctic uh, Policy with the WWF. And he's also the acting vice president of U.S. government relations. So thank you for coming up from the U.S. to answer that question. And also Craig Stewart um, is here. He is the director of Arctic uh, Canada and its programs. Um, in addition, there is literature available in the back of the room um, on CG's um, policies and some of our research on climate change. And then we also have a table to your right with um, further information and literature that's available from the WWF. I also did want to mention that on um, April the 17th at 6 a.m., I will be climbing the CN Tower um, in the, <laughs> they're clapping because it's the WWF initiative in Canada here to um, encourage people to climb the CN Tower to help raise money for their climate change program. So my legs are already burning thinking about the 144 flights of stairs that I will climb and Jared will be there too, hopefully with a coffee in hand for me because I haven't done the climb before. If um, you're interested in uh, joining us for the climb, you can sign up online. Um, if climbing the CN Tower just really is not up your alley, which <laughs> possibly it's not, um, then be creative this Saturday at 8.30. Be creative, have some fun uh, with Earth Hour and help Canada become uh, number one again. I believe we were number one in 2008 for our conservation um, efforts during the one hour called Earth Hour. So let's make Canada number one again. Thank you very much. Safe travels home. <laughs>